Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian, of course, and as usual all of our questions today come from the very fine folks who support Forgotten Weapons on Patreon. So we have I believe 25 today, let's dig right into it. Our first question is from Nat. He says, what is your favorite military uniform or camouflage pattern? Which is a little bit of a tricky one, because I don't know that I have a particular favorite, but I am a sucker for desert camouflage. I live in the desert, and I just always have a hankering for uh, interesting desert camo and desert specific equipment. It's cool, it's the sort of thing that I can uh, easily use in matches around here, and it blends into the landscape nicely depending on whether it's good desert camo or not. So probably the one I have the most of is French Daguette, which probably will surprise nobody. Um, but I have a, a variety of other desert camo uniforms. One of, the, one of the silver linings to the ongoing and extended wars in the Middle East is that a lot of countries that have no deserts have designed desert camouflage patterns. So there's a lot of desert camo out there. Uh, next question is from Joe, who says, how much ammo do you try to keep at any given time for guns that use different or expensive ammo? And my initial answer was like, all of it. Why would I have a limit? But you know, realistically there is, and I think it's about 500 rounds. So when I find, basically when I find a cartridge that I don't plan to shoot a lot, but I want to be able to do a couple of matches or some comparison shooting, something like that, that will require a bit of an ammo supply. 500 rounds is generally a pretty solid, like, that'll last me for the life of the video channel uh, sort of supply. And so that would be things like uh, 455 Webley. I found a batch of that when Fioki made it and I bought 500 rounds and that'll that'll hold me probably forever. Um, 8mm Nambu, uh, 8mm Labelle revolver, 8mm French Ordnance revolver. I don't shoot much of that. 500 rounds is really kind of like plenty uh, to go through. So yeah, about 500 rounds. God I love alcohol <laughs> says the EM2 rifle trips the bolt release automatically when a loaded magazine is inserted. Are there any other guns that do that this and why are there not more? Uh, there are probably a couple. Um, I know there are a couple out there. Um, what is it? One of the little pocket pistols does it. I want to say it's the the dry, not the dry C. Um, uh, Mauser HSC does it, the EM2 does it, uh, the Hotchkiss 1914 sort of kind of does. Uh, it doesn't automatically load around because it's an open bolt gun, but what it does do is when it's out of ammunition, when it ejects an empty feed strip, it will not let you drop the bolt until you either manually release a lever or insert a new clip, and that's there to prevent basically the same thing as in a rifle like the EM2, so that you don't uh, pull the trigger, drop the bolt, but there's no cartridge so it doesn't fire, and then you're left having to charge the action again after you load a magazine. Now the reason why there are so few guns that do this is it's generally a fairly complex and finicky little set of parts to do that. It's, uh, it's extra expense to manufacture, and it's very much an extra place where something can go wrong and break or malfunction. And the trade-off of having to manually rack the action just really isn't a big deal. Uh, if you consider a step down from an automatic bolt closure, uh, if you look at an automatic bolt hold open, just the idea that it locks open when you're empty. Um, there are even a lot of guns, military firearms, that don't do that because it's an extra bit of complexity and yeah, it's not necessarily always all that important. Um, so, yeah, too much, too much cost, too much complexity. Easier to just have the dude rack the slide or the bolt. Hanu, oh wait, no, Cody. Cody says, in a previous video somewhere, you mentioned a French museum or arsenal that has a wild bunch of prototypes, like a semi-auto converted 1886 Labelle. Have you been working to pursue an invitation to film there? I have not, not, uh, not actively. And the reason is, France in particular, a lot of the curators, like all of the curators that I'm aware of, uh, they don't tend to speak a lot of English, they speak French. And working, not just trying to get uh, access to those collections to film in them, but being able to work in them, um, it's important to me to be able to easily converse with a curator to learn about the interesting, you know, the different stuff they have. Where did it come from? What is it? 
um, oftentimes a curator will know more about any of those firearms than anyone else. So I'm kind of putting off a serious effort to get access to some of those French museums and arsenals until my own French skills are better, to the point that I can have you know, basic conversational French language skills so that I can make better use of the time. Uh, it'd be kind of a waste, uh, and I experienced this with that one arsenal that I was in. Um, it, was, it was difficult. Uh, had to go, basically I had a friend there who was translating for me uh, back and forth, and that's not ideal. Um, it's, it's hard for people to get used to speaking through a translator, I've discovered, and it really limits your ability to have a dynamic conversation. So there are some great collections in France, um, but yeah, I, I want to wait till I can better exploit any time that I can get in them, and just if I speak French, I will have a much better chance of developing a relationship with the curators and being able to get in to do some filming. Uh, now, Hanu says, are there any gas-operated revolvers? It seems like it would be easy to have a piston push the hammer back for every shot. I don't think it would be. Uh, I am not aware of any gas-operated revolvers. Uh, the problem is your piston is going to have to bypass the cylinder gap, you know, bridge the cylinder gap. Somehow you are going to have, it's going to be weird having a gas piston with a cylinder gap because you're losing a bunch of that pressure out the cylinder gap. Um, the the semi-auto or self-cocking revolvers that are out there are generally recoil operated where the whole slide and, well, the, the cylinder assembly, uh, that whole thing, the barrel and cylinder, reciprocate backward. That's like the Webley Fosbury and the Union and the Matiba. Let's see, uh, Pat says, do you have any plans to review any first generation infrared platforms that would allow you or us to see through the optics at night? I would love to. There are a couple problems. One of them is getting a good camera set up to do that. Perhaps the more difficult problem is getting access to first generation night vision devices that are still working. Some of them you can, but a lot of them, um, the perfect example being the M3 carbine snooper scope. You know, the, the US in World War II had infrared night vision scopes and spotlights. The problem is those things use a really, well, a non-standard sort of battery by today's standards. It's a big old lead acid battery and a transformer and um, I have yet to encounter one that's actually in functional condition. Maybe there's one out there, but in addition to the filming, it's the problem is finding finding working examples that someone is willing to let you go out and shoot. So if I ever have the ability and the access, that would be something very cool to do. And I'd be really curious to to try them out and find out more about you know what what did the resolution look like? How clear were they? How far could you see? That sort of thing. Samuel has a three-part question here. Uh, first part, how is the FRF1 treating me? I'd love to see more of it on Forgotten Weapons or in range. Obviously, uh, wherever you feel would be best suited. It's quite, it's doing quite well, although I don't actually have it here physically in my possession right now. Um, at the moment that I'm filming this, uh, Henry over at Nine Hole Reviews still has it. He's filming a little bit of extra footage uh, before he sends it back to me. So I haven't gotten out to do a lot of shooting of it. The video I did of it at the range was the last time that I took it out. What I'm looking forward to is, uh, of course, the, the rifle did spectacularly well on Nine Holes uh, Precision Course. Henry had loaded up a fair amount of ammunition, you know, as much as he always loads for a rifle and needed like less than half of it. So he's sending the rest of the really good ammo uh, back with the rifle. So I'm looking forward to having a chance to do some of my own shooting with proper high quality ammunition, unlike my PPU. and. Uh, uh, it might very well set the reloading press back up just to, to make ammo for that FRF1, because it's pretty cool. Uh, second part is in Q&A number 6, which I think was about 50 years ago, uh, and several subsequent videos you talked about import marks and how they can be ugly and obtrusive. How significant are the import marks on my FRF1? Uh, they're actually very subtle. They are, they are done in a very similar way to some of the really high-end pistols that have come into auction houses in the last five years or so, um, they are laser engraved on the bottom edge of the magazine well. So you have to be looking at the underside of the gun to see them, and then they are at, literally as small as the law will allow. The reason that a lot of import marks are really obnoxious and glaring is because they're done by companies that are importing hundreds or thousands of rifles at a time, and they want to have a very simple jig that they can set the thing up 
and have a very inexpensive uh, machine, hence the dot matrix stippling marks that you'll see with like recent century stuff. Um, they want to be able to run those guns through and import mark them as quickly as possible. When you're doing more valuable stuff, higher end stuff, it's worth the time first off to use a uh, an importer that has a laser, which the, the good ones do, and then they will set up find the the least uh, least obnoxious place that the marking can legally be put, um, and and set it up to do the, the make it as unobtrusive as possible. And so that was the case with the FRF one. The third part here is then. Da, 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 da. Uh, finally, have you had a chance to watch the French slash Belgian movie Fifteen Minutes of War? And if so, what are your thoughts? Yes, I have. Uh, and if you watched the Nine Hole Reviews video on the FRF One, the movie clips that you see in that are from Fifteen Minutes of War. That's a movie about Loyata, which was like one of the first really major GIGN deployments. Um, it was the first use of a, a sniper simultaneous shot in the modern sort of parlance. Uh, it is a tremendously cool uh, historical event, and that movie does a really poor job of conveying the actual history of the, the event. Um, I think the movie is quite badly done um, on a lot of different levels, in fact. The guns that they use are MOS 36s that are badly worked up by the prop master to look vaguely like uh, FRF ones. The scopes are completely wrong, the scope mounts are completely wrong. Um, they don't. They, they add a bunch of unnecessary drama to the event. Like they have the the GIGN leader feuding with the commander of the Foreign Legion group that's there, which is nonsense. That didn't happen in reality. They add an American CIA agent into the story who was never there for no reason whatsoever, except to throw more artificial drama into it. Um, the the actual events of the shooting itself are not quite realistically portrayed. So yeah, unfortunately, it, it's it's kind of a crap movie. So I wouldn't recommend going out of your way to see it. If you happen to see it, like if it happens to be accessible to you, yeah, go ahead and watch it. But don't have real high expectations. And I would recommend uh, studying up on what actually happened either before or after the movie so that you get the right idea. Uh, Dan says the AR-15 has benefited from improved materials and optics since its creation. Uh, would these same advancements be enough to make something like the OICW a viable concept now? Um, I have a video on the OICW, or at least on a mock-up of one. The idea basically was to combine a programmable smart grenade launcher with a 5.56 kinetic uh, carbine into a single weapon that offered, you know, it was a semi-auto grenade launcher and a select fire carbine. The problem with the OICW, I think, wasn't really in its materials. It wasn't in the things that have been improved since. It was simply trying to do too much in a single package. And you ended up with a gun that was very heavy and very bulky, and had sort of limited utility as either a carbine or a grenade launcher. And I think all those things would still be true today. Um, the, the way to do something like that is make the grenade launcher a standalone single weapon. Um, and give guys carbines. The, the compromise that, that we have, that we've had for many decades now, is something like the M203, where you can put a single shot grenade launcher onto a standard rifle or carbine without that much problem. Like That makes a pretty good compromise weapon uh, if you want to have a some amount of grenade firing capability uh, in the squad without really sacrificing the, the rifle capacity. Obviously that it's always compromises, but no, I don't think the OICW is viable yet. I don't think it ever will be, really. Just because you're, you're trying, you can only make the gun so heavy before it's not practical. Um, and the laws of physics are such that if you're making a shoulder-fired grenade launcher, that's a lot of weight to start with. And the only way you can add a carbine onto that is to make it a really undersized carbine that's, yeah. Uh, John says, I was thinking about the recent influx of the Ethiopian stockpile guns and how it would be interesting to see a book on the subject, from the history of how the guns got to Ethiopia to the importer finding them, and then pictorials of some of the guns that came in. Do you know if anyone is uh, working on something like this, or that, or if Headstamp Publishing would be interested in doing it? I think that'd be a really cool book. Uh, unfortunately, as far as I'm aware, nobody's doing something like that, and I don't know how much opportunity there is now, given that a lot of the guns are already sold. 
Um, this is the sort of thing that you would want to document through the actual importing process. You can see something like that with, um, there was a book that IMA did about their import of all the guns from Nepal. And that was called Guns of the Gurkhas, I believe, or Treasure, Treasure is Where You Find It, I think is what they called it. And that's a, a cool book. Um, and it is something that if, if we had access or we knew about something like this going on in advance, yeah, that'd be a really cool thing to do. Um, unfortunately, I think the opportunity has passed for this case. Uh, Jordan says, what country has always stayed ahead of the curve in weapon design? Nobody. Uh, there have been people who are better at it than others, and there are people that are worse, but nobody's ever been consistently, like, always ahead of the curve. Um, you look at, you know, a lot of people would, would suggest Germany uh, with their developments of submachine guns in World War I and the assault rifle in World War II, but they went into World War I with bolt-action rifles. Um, they have not been consistently ahead of the curve. They've been, they've been able to work on it. Um, they were behind the curve at times, uh, bouncing back and forth with the French. They were behind the curve with the Gewehr 88. They were behind the curve with the uh, Gewehr 7184. But they were ahead in other places. So, same with the French. Some places they've been ahead. They got smokeless powder before anyone else. But they went into World War II with a bolt-action rifle. The US? Semi-auto rifle going into World War II, that's excellent. World War I, we didn't even have a machine gun. So, uh, Admiral Tiberius says, what three firearms where no known examples exist would you most like to do a video on? Uh, the three that came to mind, because they're ones that I've, well, I've already done videos on because I was interested enough in them to do a video without actually having an original example, uh, one would be the Hell Regal, which is this really funky uh, World War I belt-fed submachine gun sort of thing. Um, one of them is the Chebehol uh, 1918, which is the French short cartridge select fire sort of submachine gun. Kind of, sort of. Again, I don't know of any of those that still exist. And the other would be the Stinger, um, the US Marine Corps uh, sort of homemade, in fact literally homemade, ship made, um, high rate of fire light machine gun squad automatic weapon sort of thing. Um, I did a video with a real gun uh, on the Stinger, but it was a reproduction Stinger. It would be awesome to be able to do a video on, say, Tony Stein's actual Stinger, but as far as I know, none of those guns, especially Stein's, none of them survive today. Ed says, do you think the French army should have gone with the FAMAS G2 instead of sticking with the F1 for so long? No, I don't think it really matters. So the, the changes to the G2 are effectively, aside from some ergonomic changes, the G2 uses uh, NATO standard sort of magazines. It uses FNC magazines interchangeable with AR mags. And it has a 1 in 12, or, um, sorry, has a 1 in 9 twist barrel so that it can use SS-109 NATO standard ammunition. The F1 FAMAS uses its own proprietary ammunition, or a proprietary magazine, and it has a 1 in 12 twist. It can only use 55 grain, effectively M193 ammunition. I think actually M193 is better than M855, better than SS-109. It is theoretically a more accurate cartridge. The SS-109 has a small steel penetrator in it, which in theory gives it some better barrier penetration, but it also makes it more difficult to manufacture those cartridges, those projectiles, um, as consistently and thus as accurately as standard plain 55 grain ball. So I think 55 grain ball is just fine. In some ways it's uh, better for military applications. It tumbles more easily on impact. There's no problem at all using that. And then the magazines just don't really matter because the French army, like pretty much any national army, isn't going out trying to standardize magazines with a bunch of other random guns that it might buy. Uh, they're going to pick whatever magazine they want, and they're going to make enough of them to equip the 400,000 rifles that they produced. So whether it's a FAMAS mag, or an AR mag, or a G36 mag, doesn't matter. So the, the problems that eventually developed with the F1 were simply that all of the guns were very old, and they were getting worn out, and they were running out of spare parts. And they could have, I mean, they could have avoided some of those problems by adopting the G2, just because the G2s were 20 years later. 
and so they would have had rifles that were 20 years newer. They would have pushed those issues down the road, um, but ultimately they would have had the same thing. Like you, you have to make new rifles every few decades because they just kind of wear out. Zerv says, shotguns for military and police, and perhaps a lesser degree for home defense, have seen a decrease in usage due to the popularity of the intermediate caliber rifle. Could you envision a scenario where the shotgun, highly modified perhaps with a new type of ammunition, could regain popularity? Perhaps a significant design change in ammunition, specifically for box magazine fed shotguns, combined with improved long range performance with something like flight control, shot release? No, I really don't see the shotgun ever making a significant military I wouldn't even say comeback, because it never, it was never particularly popular in the first place. It's always been a very niche weapon, and I think the reason for that is the bulk of the ammunition, uh, with a close second reason being the lack of precision. So you can't have a target match with a shotgun. This may not seem like the most significant element, but that is a significant element to a military bureaucracy. Um, you need marksmanship and accuracy, and you just by definition sort of can't do that with a multi-projectile uh, uh, cartridge. On top of that, no matter what you do to improve how, how tight shot patterns, you're still talking about very large cartridges. Um, it's difficult to have, you know, if you look at the, the size of a typical military rifle magazine, and convert that into shotgun shells, you're looking at five to six round magazines that are the size of a 20 or 30 round rifle magazine. And so you just can't carry enough ammunition to make that a viable standard weapon. Uh, I could see them being used by the police, absolutely. They have a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can fire through them, including a lot of less than lethal options which is an ideal thing for police, but not particularly relevant for a military force. Um, and th the modifications you describe would be a good thing. Um, certainly things like flight control buckshot are fantastic improvements to most shotgun performance, but they're not going to turn it into a, a military standard weapon. Nick says, of all the artillery level uh, firearms, which ones are most new to the hobby friendly? Uh, I would say the black powder uh, cannons. There are there's sort of a class of single shot breech loading cannon, typically from the 1890s or thereabouts. They they're large bore, so you're thinking you're looking at 37 to 50 millimeter in that sort of range. They typically have a, a giant wheeled carriage. The the ones that are most common, I think, are probably the the Krupp 50 millimeter guns made for the Thai military. A number of those came into the country. There are some Japanese guns that fit the same sort of form factor. And the things that the advantages that these guns have are, first off, some of them are old enough that they're legally antiques and not registered as destructive devices. Um, you might think, oh, if they're not NFA regulated, they're going to cost less. No, actually, in this case, those cost more because the fact that you don't have to register them gives them a greater value in the market, and so the price goes up. But aside from that, um, they are relatively small and light. I mean, they're still a couple hundred pounds, but you can break down the wheels and the barrel, and there you can move them as one person. You can put them in a car, um, or at least a pickup truck. You don't have to get like a giant U-Haul trailer, enclosed trailer, to carry around a, an artillery piece. They use black powder, which is a major benefit. If you start, I don't remember the exact limit, but if you start storing cannon powder, you very quickly get to the point where you need to have a federal explosives license, and you need to have a federally inspected magazine to store your powder in. And high pressure powders in cannon shells, that becomes, you've got major safety issues. You really need to know what you're doing to reload that sort of stuff. When you're talking about these older black powder cartridges, the safety factors are much higher. Um, everything is much simpler. You can generally use at least the ones that I've seen, a lot of people use cast lead projectiles. You're talking about a lot of lead, but fundamentally the process is the same as casting a rifle bullet, which is again way easier than dealing with a, a zinc or steel or brass or copper solid projectile and driving bands and the things that you get into with high pressure modern sorts of cannons. If you want to have the, you know, a big thunk and a big cloud of smoke and, you know, put a big old three-inch hole through the size of a car or something at the range at a, a cannon shoot. 
early black powder cannons are definitely, in my opinion, the easy way in. I guess the other one might be some of the little anti-tank guns, um, because the ammunition is relatively small. In some cases, original ammunition is still available to be had. Well, I'd go with the, the black powder cannons. They're just cooler. Uh, Ian, a different Ian, not me, says, I hear from time to time variations on the idea that we're spoiled by modern rifles often being capable of one minute of angle or better accuracy. Well, I don't have a clear idea on what was typical in the past, particularly with the rather generous sight markings on older military rifles. What was considered an acceptable accuracy for a standard rifle of yesteryear? And when did this change? It varies country to country, but as a general rule, about four minute of angle is the accuracy standard for factory produced military rifles. And that hasn't really changed much until very recently. Um, bolt action, semi-autos, the M1, the M14. I probably should have looked it up before this video. I don't, I can't tell you off the top of my head what the current accuracy standard is for military acceptance of an M16 or an M4 in the US. But generally speaking, worldwide, throughout history, 4 MOA has been about the standard. It's not nearly as accurate as a lot of people think. Malarkey1943 says, have you ever considered trying to raise awareness of the channel or books or head stamp by going on something like the Joe Rogan podcast where the audience isn't necessarily gun minded, but are open to interesting people or subjects? I've considered it. I think it would be a lot of fun to be on the Joe Rogan podcast. Um, I'm not exactly sure how one does that, or if he would have any interest in having me on that show. Uh, other, I've never really done an event like that, but I would certainly be open to it. I, I think it's, I always find it very interesting to talk to subject matter experts in fields that I'm not particularly uh, educated in. It's, it's fun to hear about the, the details of someone else's passionate subject. So yeah, I'd be happy to do that myself. Um, I don't have a lot of spare time to go hunting around for things like that. And that's probably why I haven't pursued it um, to date. Uh, Michael says, what gun's popularity just stumps you? That would be the Zip 22. Most guns, I can understand why people would want them, even if I don't want them and don't share the motivation. Uh, you know, the, the, like the really junky current production ring of fire type semi-auto pistols. Like, I have absolutely no interest in one of those whatsoever, but I know why people do. They're inexpensive and they're accessible. Um, very, very expensive precision rifles. Uh, that one's pretty easy to understand. Not something I want, well, not something I can really exploit. I'm not a good enough shop to, to make practical use of them, but I get why other people would. Um, it gets a little harder for with guns like the FK Bruneau and the Court semi-autos where you're paying, you're buying, you're paying for so much for the gun that you could get all sorts of other things instead. And it's really more a piece of art. To me, it's very much like buying a very fancy watch. You know, I can get a gun that's going to be just as practically effective for me as a court for 20% the price, if that, probably less. Um, but then again, I don't have to go spend $20,000 or whatever on a really high-end fancy watch when my phone tells the time. Or a $20 Casio electronic watch will tell the time just as well. Uh, but people decide to put the money into something that is, if you look at it cynically, it's a status symbol. If you look at it a little more uh, generously, it is an appreciation of the expert labor and craftsmanship that went into creating it. So I get all those. The Zip 22, as far as I can tell, offers nothing. Um, it was cheap, but it, you can't even hold the thing. Like I really don't understand why anyone would buy one of those. I guess the sole explanation is because it is so bad that it is a curiosity because of its terribleness. But that doesn't explain why most people bought them. That, that explains why probably people like you who are watching this might think it'd be fun to have one. because. Hey, you know, they're pretty cheap, it's not that much money, and, and it's just so awful it's funny. But there was a market for those things outside of that rationale, and I truly do not understand that market. Uh, Bracket 
says, what do different world militaries do with their surplus and obsolete equipment? Uh, it depends, obviously, on where and when. Historically, uh, militaries may destroy left, uh, obsolete or replaced upgraded equipment. They may transfer it to friendly countries. So, for example, the British Empire would kind of do this hand-me-down thing with guns uh, when the British Army itself got some new pattern of rifle. The old pattern would go into its reserve, and what its reserve had would then go to the colonies. Nepal is a perfect example of this, because for like a couple hundred years this kept happening, and the Nepalese never threw out anything. They just put it into storage, and what, 20 or 30, 20 years ago now? Something like that? <coughs> uh, IMA bought up the entire Nepalese obsolete arsenal, and they had stuff going back to flintlocks all the way up through SMLEs. Um, that the British had just kind of handed down to the Nepalese, and I'm sure they were, well, I know they were doing it with other countries as well. So that's the thing. Um, sometimes it's, uh, the French had colonial relations with a number of countries that are no longer actually French colonies, but they often help supply military forces there with surplus obsolete equipment. Uh, these days it's mostly destruction. A hundred years ago, there were a lot of sales of that sort of stuff. You had companies like Bannerman uh, or like Interordnance uh, or uh, Interarms that would buy up surplus material that was relatively modern uh, and then resell it to other countries or to the commercial civilian market. Brian says, <laughs> have your fabulous flowing locks of hair ever become entangled in a firearms mechanism? No, not yet, thank goodness. However, I did once make the mistake of trying to look cool draping a belt of machine gun ammo on metal links around the back of my neck, and that was an unpleasant ten minutes or so of trying to get it untangled and removed. So I will not do that again. Uh, Zboom says, what are your thoughts on Russian silenced handguns like the PSS, SM4, or OTS-38 Stechkin? I find the concept of the 7.62x42mm SP4 with a piston in the cartridge very interesting. It is a super cool cartridge. This is a completely silent cartridge by nature of no gas is released from it. Um, it's a sealed cartridge. When you fire it, the powder expands a captive piston inside the cartridge, which pushes the bullet down the barrel, but none of the gas actually comes out. That piston is sealed, and so the gun is completely quiet. And it is, as I recall, a one or I think it's a two shot Derringer, so there's no action noise either. Uh, I would love to get my hands on some of these things someday to film. Uh, probably won't happen short of a trip to Russia, but who knows? Hopefully that will be able to happen at some point. John says, I'm sure you have an amazing library. How about a video where you pull a dozen or so of your, of your favorites off the shelf and do a very brief review of each? This is the, I've gotten this sort of request a lot, and I, to some extent it, it's not something very practical. Um, the problem is, the way I see my library is it's basically one giant encyclopedia, and every time I get a book I'm either getting a new entry in the encyclopedia or I'm expanding an existing entry. And so to me the idea of pick your three favorite books out of your reference library is kind of like pick your three favorite entries in an encyclopedia. I, well, it depends what I'm trying to find out about. If I'm really curious about Johnson semi-auto rifles, well, that's easy. I've got a really good book on the Johnson. That, that would be my go-to. If I'm really curious about French rifles, I'd pull my own book out. Well, or one of the many French language books I've got on the subject. Um, but just like straight up favorite gun reference books, I can't say I really have any particular favorite. Um, their information, I don't really have an emotional connection to them. That said, um, I am working on setting up a new filming studio that will have a, bun a finally have a really big bookshelf set where I can have everything all in one place. And I do plan, I will film a video about the library and about the book collection uh, when I get that up and running. So I will have something on the books, but it will probably be a couple more months. Uh, Michael says, by the time you answer these questions, the Morphe auction will be over with, which it is. Did you buy the Lewis gun they were selling? That is an interesting question. I wanted to. Um, well, I wanted to give it a try. That Lewis gun they had was actually Bill Wooden's Lewis gun. Bill Wooden was a very highly respected cartridge collector who lived uh, right in the Tucson area. 
um, not that far from me. I had a chance to visit him a couple times. He was an incredibly knowledgeable and very friendly guy. Um, I learned a bunch of great stuff from him. I really wish that I had the opportunity to visit him more and to learn more about his uh, collection. It was kind of funny when I first met him. <coughs> He's a cartridge collector, you know. And so I, I'm a gun collector myself. There's, you'd think that those two are like interchangeable, but they're really kind of not. I walked in and I asked him, like, oh, do you collect guns too? And he's like, well, I'm not really interested in guns. I just do ammunition. And then here are his like 18 machine guns. Um, because he was in the Pacific Theater in World War II and he brought back some really good stuff and he had some very cool guns. He had a, a Thompson gun that had been in his family since it was first purchased in the 1930s, which is really cool. At any rate, uh, his, he passed away several years ago, his uh, 303 British Lewis gun was up for sale at the Morphe Auction House, and it was the number two gun that I was going to try to buy. Uh, and it ended up selling, I think, for $14,000 uh, hammer price, plus a 20% in Morphe's uh, premium, so like 17 grand, which is a pretty darn good deal. <coughs> that gun came with a number of accessories, and it apparently wasn't just a magnificent operating, running. It wasn't like factory new, but really good condition and very smooth running gun. So no, I did not buy it. Uh, actually what I did do instead is I had enough uh, that I was able to bid on and win the Type 96 Nambu light machine gun that they had. So that'll be coming to the channel in like six months when the NFA transfer clears on it. Uh, interestingly or not, says relative to the standards of their respective eras, which do you feel was the worst light machine gun? The Shosha in World War I or the Brita Model 30 in World War II? That's an easy one. The Brita 30 is definitely the worst gun. The Shosha had a great excuse. Nobody's done this before, and we need a ton of them right now. And none of those things apply to the, the Brita 30. The Brita was developed between the wars in the 30s. Um, they had the, the experience of seeing what was used in World War I. Um, they had the BAR to look at. By the time that thing was up and running, like they had the the Degtrev would have been fairly new, but they had uh, the ZB-26, they had the Chatellero. There are a lot of really good models for a proper light machine gun, and Brita ignored them all uh, and made something that was really pretty lackluster. So yeah, the Shosha had problems, but they're excusable problems. There's no excuse for the Brita 30. Nicholas says, do you think you will be able to uh, continue to go on as forgotten weapons by mail indefinitely? Uh, are you keeping slash buying any of the guns sent you? Um, I'm not buying any of the guns that I'm being sent. They're generally all other people's collections that are on loan. Um, there have been one or two guns that I've purchased, not, not on loan, that have arrived and I've done video on. Um, but I don't plan to continue being forgotten weapons by mail. Um, I will, by the time you see this, I will have started doing uh, a limited bit of traveling. And that'll, I, unless, unless something goes catastrophically wrong with a new and extended pandemic, um, the travel schedule will pick up in the second half of the year. And we'll be back to a lot of the original model. It's been a very interesting experiment doing this by mail. Uh, you will still see a bunch of loaner gun videos because of the, the backlog and the time frame that I try to work on. I try to keep like a month ahead. So. A month after I've stopped, a month after I've filmed the last loaner gun, you'll probably still be seeing a, a video on a loaned gun. Um, it's been an interesting experiment. I think it could be something that would be relatively sustainable. The, to my mind, the quality of the content drops a little bit, or at least the diversity of the com, uh, content, because um, I don't have an SOT, so I can't be mailed machine guns. I can't real. I can't get anything from museums. Uh, I have access, I've been able to access some really cool, rare, and interesting collector guns this way, but not really prototypes. Um, and I really like getting a chance to, to show you those, uh, show those things to you. So uh, I look forward to getting back on the road and being able to get back into some of the places that I was going uh, before this all started. And our last question from Alex is, based on your experience in practical pistol competition, i.e. two-gun, 
Uh, what do you find makes an accurate, good shooting pistol? Red dot optics seem like a great advance, but how do you how do you find bore axis, grip angle, etc.? What's your favorite nine millimeter shooter on the market at the moment? To be honest, um, the thing that is far and away the most important to me is zeroing. Is the gun zeroed? Whatever the sights are, if I put those sights on a target, will I actually hit the target? And you might be surprised how often the answer to that is, well, not really. And you kind of have to aim a little bit over there, or a little bit up here. Um, for me, if a gun zeroed, the ergonomics have to be really quite bad to, to really be a problem. Uh, it, a CC38 is really quite bad, but of all of the modern readily available pistols, you know, Glocks, Walthers, HKs, they're all totally acceptable. Um, once you once you get a lot of trigger time in on something, yeah, you may develop a favorite. You may have this little feature that you like better, or this style of trigger you like better than that. But for me at least, my practice is almost always on a different gun every day, and that's given me, well, it's given me an ability to kind of pick up anything and be able to be decent at least with it. And what I found is, like, it's kind of like a car. Some cars are better than others, but as long as the thing works, it'll get you from point A to point B pretty much just as well as anything else. Especially considering that speed and maneuverability don't really matter, because if you're driving from A to B, you're on public roads, and you're pretty much going to drive the same way in any car. Well, same thing with a pistol. You're always going to be limited by your own ability, your own skill. And so most of the time, unless a gun's really egregiously bad, that'll be the limiting factor, not the gun itself. And so it doesn't really make that much difference what one you have. Um, I really honestly cannot say that I have a favorite 9mm pistol at the moment. So that is all of our questions for today. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, a big thank you once again to everyone who submitted questions. I got I think about 300 questions this time, which is about 12 times as many as I can actually do. So uh, I set aside a second batch of those questions that we'll be doing for next month's Q&A as well. Um, thanks to you all for uh, making Forgotten Weapons a part of your day. I'll catch you tomorrow.